we were real serious about this year of no. And then we make this quilt called Yes, More, Please. And how do these seemingly conflicting concepts actually make sense? It's a year of saying no to getting spread too thin, which means then a great big giant yes to other pursuits. Hey, Seamsiders, you may have heard, but the Nook is turning two years old real soon. And so to celebrate, I'm giving away two annual memberships good for the entire year of 2024 to two people listening to the sound of my voice right now. I won't be sharing this giveaway anywhere else but here on Seamside, so seems to me your chances are pretty good you could win. To enter the giveaway, there's a link in the show notes below. Drop over there to get your name in the hat, and you have until December 31st, 2023. I'll draw the winners on January 1st, 2024, and the winners will get 12 months of quilty goodness. That's 12 different workshops hosted by visiting artists, 24 sewing circles hosted by me, along with countless other sewing circles hosted by other good folks on the Nook. Every day of the year, there's something happening over on the Nook. There's so much to love. I hope to see you there. Today, I'm joined by my good friend and collaborator, Heidi Parks. When I went to visit her in Milwaukee over the summer, we decided that we were long overdue to make a collaborative quilt. Yes, More Please was that quilt. And it was born out of a conversation about creating more space in our lives for all the good things. Heidi, welcome back to Seam Side. How are you doing today? Thank you, Zach. It is wonderful to get to see this quilt completed and to get to share the story with you. This quilt, for folks that haven't seen it, is maximalist. Like there is not an empty square inch on this quilt. And the whole thing is, you know, one of our preferred sizes, which is about, it's probably a little smaller than 60 by 60, but not too much. No, it's not. It's around 40 by 40. Okay. Heidi says 40 by 40. I'll take a ruler after we get off this recording studio. We'll see. We'll see who's right. (laughs) Yeah. It's not 60 by 60, but either way, It may be small, but it's got a lot of stories packed into it. And Heidi and I want to tell those to you, if you don't mind. So Heidi, let's just set the stage, right? So I was coming to see you this summer. And the reason why I was coming is because you and I, the previous summer, had had such a fun time at the Wisconsin Quilt Museum rummage sale. Because we realized if we volunteer, we get to shop before they open to the general public. And we got some wonderful fabric. So I came back for a second summer. And You and I went to volunteer. And that's where we got a lot of this fabric and a lot of this idea. And that was kind of the backdrop for this conversation. I was so delighted that you thought the rummage happening again was a top reason for us to get together and to come visit Milwaukee. Wait, it wasn't? Wasn't that the reason why you came out? Was the rummage? Yeah, Yeah, Yeah. totally. And to see you, of course. I I know, but I was so surprised. I was so surprised, Uh, but also, you know, not surprised because we had the best time and I was glad you wanted to come visit me. You've been trying to get out of Brooklyn a little more in general. So I was, I was as happy as could be that you wanted to come. And the rummage is one of my favorite days of the year. And so when that email popped up in my box, because I made sure to get on that volunteer list last Mm -hmm. year. And when that email popped in my box. I went ahead and signed up for a time slot. And then I wrote you, said, Heidi, let's do this thing. (laughs) That's how serious we were. (laughs) And I said, yes, more, please. Come on down. Yes, more, please. Let's do it. So looking at this quilt, for folks to know, we divided this quilt in two halves, basically. We worked on the principal parts together while we were still in Milwaukee. But then Heidi was left with the left half and I took the right half back to Brooklyn. And we finished it up separately. And Heidi, on your half, one of the the crown jewels, if you will, is one of your signature calendars. Would you like to share that story? Yes. I love looking at moon cycles and tracking the moon in my quilts, as well as standard calendars. And this one, it felt fun to go beyond just the seven across method. I focused more on the waxing of the moon and the waning of the moon. So when the moon was on the darker side, that shows up as these dark circles. And then when it's on the lighter side, it shows up as these 
gold circles. And I tracked all the way back to the day that you told me you were coming to Milwaukee (laughs) till what was at the time, the present moment when you were in Milwaukee. And it was a lot of fun for me to place those moons in a way that was a little bit uh, fresh feeling for me. And I love the stark contrast that we're seeing here between the really dark moons that are all kind of wonky, ovalish shapes and the brown gold moons, which came from an old tie that we got from the rummage sale. You remember that? It was this I do. wide, wide, wide 1970s kind of gold paisley on brown tie that worked so perfectly here. It did. It was a beautiful color for the moon. And you were working on a commission with our friend Amanda and you had to learn some things about ties. And then I also added in this toile fabric and that's some of the moon cycles. And yeah, it turned out beautifully. And then coursing through your moon calendar and then into my side, my side air quotes, Mm -hmm. uh, is a blue piece of bias tape. What inspired that? Because that's something you started and then you left it dangling for me when you sent the left hand (laughs) side to Brooklyn and I got to tack down the right side of this dangling bias tape. So what inspired that? Do you remember? Well, I, I remember very clearly because we cut the quilt into three pieces. Our first cut was dividing my side and your side. And it's this wonderful wobbly where it's more mine on the bottom and more yours on the top, the way that it waves across. And then we were about to go to a panel discussion in Milwaukee, and I wanted to do a little bit of applique or some extra stuff, and my side just felt too big to take to work on on site. So I just cut it right across the middle, and I think you were a little horrified when I did that. (laughs) I was amazed. I'm like, who is this badass quilter that's my friend Heidi Parks? (laughs) It it struck a little fear, but I was fearless. And then when I was reassembling the quilt, of course, the first thing I had to do was reassemble that cut when I divided my part in two. And I used this blue bias tape to go across and fix that that seam. So I left it a little bit long because I thought you might want to do something with it to make it look more natural rather than apologizing for itself as something just healing a big cut in the quilt. Yeah. And we'll we'll get to where that piece of pale blue bias tape meanders to because it goes all the way down to the bottom right hand corner of the quilt and lands on this crazy quilt Victorian block that I found at the rummage sale. But before we get there, I, I remember sitting with you at that panel discussion that you were speaking on. And I was also working on a little piece of that. I was working on the giraffes at the time. Wasn't I? Yes, you were. Okay. So I was working on the giraffes at the time. And so folks who have seen the quilt may recognize that there's a pair of two very friendly looking giraffes whose necks are intertwining and they're looking at each other. And that was inspired from the first iteration of this collaborative quilt, we started with an entirely different quilt. It was a vintage crib quilt, baby quilt, had some really precious animal applique on it. And we wanted to pull in some of that imagery, but we very quickly discovered that the padding over time must have condensed or hardened or something because we could not for the life of us hand sew through it. It was a machine quilted quilt. So maybe it just never mattered to the initial maker that it was hard to get through. Yeah, totally. And we didn't know when we we wanted to save our hands, but we didn't want to throw the giraffes to the curb. And so we ended up pulling that motif from the original quilt and putting it in the second iteration. And it's a really sweet, whimsical touch. Another uh, way of us just showing our friendship here, isn't it? Yes, yes. I loved it as us showing our friendship. And I think also our attraction to that phrase, yes, more please, was from this place of feeling really lucky and both being able to be sustainably employed as quilters was for both of us a wild dream. And we made it happen in our lives in very different ways. But to both be around the same moment in our lives and feel like we had reached it was very exciting. And it's that kind of moment that leaves you in awe and you got to step back and see the big picture and see, wow, I was there and now I'm here. And how in the world did that happen? And giraffe with that view at a distance 
felt so symbolic and perfect for it as well. Oh, that's such a beautiful connection. And, you know, I mean, Heidi, it wasn't it wasn't that long ago that I was still in the public school classroom is a little bit longer for you. But what's so fascinating to think about is that even though like no two paths are the same, but you did it, I did mm-hmm. it. People listening may be thinking about making similar moves and it is possible. It might take mm-hmm. like it did for me years of planning or it might take like in the case of our friend Luke Kane sleeping on friends futons for a few months or something like that right like it could be a tough haul, Yeah my path you... is more of a Luke path. <laughs> yeah, I was going to let you put it in your words but exactly there's different mm-hmm. paths but they can lead to beautiful places and so yes more please is uh just an acknowledgement of gratitude for being in this place. Yes. Yes, very much Where did so. this fabric come from that we made our lettering out of? That is a fabric that I got at the rummage last year. So the first time that you helped at the rummage. And I was attracted to it first. And then I noticed the label and I thought, oh, that was designed by my friend Jennifer Sampu. And I met her when I was teaching in Madeline Island. And then after I bought that fabric, you and I drove up to Madeline Island and we co-taught our sewing in place class together. And I put some of that fabric on the bottom of my quilt, which is called Magical Thinking Attempt Number 7. I used that fabric because I had just acquired it at the rummage and it made me think of Jennifer, who I had met the year before. And when we were thinking about this collaborative project, reminiscing about the year before and that maybe it's a thing now that I get to have a visit from my friend Zach in June in Milwaukee. That felt really appropriate as a starting point for our fabric. I would also add that I tend to think a lot about the chakras when I consider color with my yoga background. And orange is from that sacral chakra, which is a place of creativity, uh, that longing to make, not necessarily sharing what you've made, that I think of as more of a throat chakra, which would be a blue color, which is also showing up in our quilt. But that sacral chakra, the place of creativity, that place of longing to give birth to something, and that felt so connected to both of us, longing to be artists and to live these creative self-led lives and then getting to actually do it. Yeah, but let's not overlook the the red dashes on this mm-hmm. print, right? So the print is this peachy orange solid with parallel lines of red paint strokes, almost imagine. And so in in chakra symbolism, I associate, correct me if I'm wrong, but mm-hmm. red with security. Yeah, red is the root chakra, the grounding, the tailbone that keeps you connected to the earth, feeling stable and steady and Yes, there's a sustainability that we have now reached that we did not previously have. So it's all there. mm -hmm, It is there. Now, one of the really fun moments for me that I had working on on my half that you just saw after it was all done was we ran out of Jennifer Sampu's fabric, or at least I did here in Brooklyn. And so I had to get a little bit creative. And so I found two solids, a peachy and a red, that were as similar as I could get to the original fabric. And I recreated the print just by cutting out little wonky strips of little red and stitching them down and making essentially more of the print that I needed to finish out this piece. Some of the areas I got to play with the density and so the red dashes come closer together. Other places I spread them out so they're a little less dense. But it was just a really fun exercise and like, look what we quilters can do, you know? Mm-hmm. We're not we're not bound to just the fabric that we have. We can make our own stuff. And the way that the dashes spin around the period in the exclamation point is so beautiful. It adds this rich playfulness as well as when you cut the fabric because it was you that cut out the letters, you put the y and yes on more of a horizontal And then a lot of the other lines were more vertical. And there's something so visually pleasing that keeps the movement in the quilt flowing around that I love that way. Oh, with this quilt, your eyes never stop. That's for sure. (laughs) Since you invoked the the dot of the exclamation point, folks that haven't seen the quilt need to know that uh, Yes More Please 
is roughly divided into thirds, right? Yes is one third, more is one third, please is one third. But the exclamation point runs the entire right-hand side of the quilt. And that was inspired by this century-old Victorian-era crazy quilt block that I found at the rummage sale for 50 cents, if you can believe it. And it's beautiful velvets, black velvets, some fire engine red and eggplant, something that looks a little avocado-y or wheat-like. And I picked up that that crazy quilt block because I couldn't just leave it there for 50 cents. And it was just a happy accident that the centerpiece of this block, this round oval circle, was a very similar peach shade as all of our text on this quilt. And all of a sudden, I'm like, wait, this isn't just a dot. This is the point of an exclamation. So it actually, I reverse engineered the exclamation point from this quilt block, which was a really fun moment. I love how it turned out. And it was such an incredible find at the rummage. I think that leads me to another fabric that was an important find at the rummage, which is this uh, checkerboard print. And you had an incredible story as to why you were drawn to that fabric. Yeah, you know, it's funny, Heidi. Thanks for pointing that out because uh, it's no secret that me and orange, just as orange is not my first color that I go to, right? So I'm kind of surprised that I found this orange and black checkerboard fabric and didn't immediately think, oh, Halloween, right? I was like, oh, oh, this is cool. (laughs) And the reason I was connecting with it was that just a week or two previously, I had stumbled across a pair of words that felt like a really appropriate description of my voice as a maker. And the two words were graphic and organic. And when I look at this orange and black batik print checkerboard, it embodies graphic and organic so beautifully. It's graphic because it's a high contrast checkerboard. It's organic because it is a batik. It is a print. And so no two squares are exactly the same. And because it just so, uh, so well embodied, the um, how I perceive my look and my voice to be, I bought every single yard of that they had. I think I came home with eight or nine yards. It's quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Still got plenty if anybody needs some. <laughs> no, it's and it it adds to that vibrating quality of the quilt. There's also a a, a beautiful indigo fabric that you included that has these white polka dots on it. That's a dark background. And then with Jennifer's fabric and with my moons, this vibrating to me and part of the quilt being so visually abundant, to me at least, is a technique that I love, that I talk about a lot when I'm teaching. And that's an idea that was introduced to me when I was studying in college, is this idea of verbing something. So you say you want more. How do you show more? How do you do more in the quilt rather than just saying it or thinking of a visual of it. Uh, Let's actually applique a lot. Let's actually use prints that are abundant. And so for me, that action of adding a whole lot to the quilt is very exciting. And honestly, that was part of the, one of the most fun things for me was getting your half that you had poured so much labor and love into and then beginning to think, okay, how do I marry these two halves? Because as the 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 person who's who was tasked with joining these two together, I wanted to go beyond just simply like stitching them together. I wanted to make sure they felt cohesive. And so I had to mm-hmm. add certain elements from your half into mine and from my half into yours. And one of the elements I brought from your side was the the blue indigo dyed pieces, like where we see the little bunny rabbits in the bottom left hand corner. Mm-hmm. The closest fabric that I had to that was what I call this indigo snowball. They look like melting snowballs. And I'd bought a couple yards of that way back when to make a shirt. And it's often the shirt I wear now for like New Year's Eve, like when I want to go like have like a little nice shirt to wear out on the town, you know, or to my friend's house, which is probably more likely where where I'm going. (laughs) But anyway, it was it was the only indigo fabric that I had. But I love that it both complements but also activates that what you had already put into place there. Yes. And you mentioning my bunny rabbits as well, I think is part of this idea that we both wanted to create special surprises for each other. So we did a lot of work together in person. We knew the quilting wasn't done. When 
I think when you were here, you did a little more sewing than I did. <laughs> and I was feeling like I had some catch up to do with, I had just been applicating my circles, but I knew ultimately I wanted to do a lot more than just put circles on my half. So when I get to sit down to really truly work on the quilt, there were a lot of special surprises I added. I knew since I was adding that blue bias tape to heal that cut that I put in it, which if you're looking at the quilt like it's a clock, that would be about nine o'clock. And so up in that top left corner of the quilt, I added a lot of blue bias tape around the yes, in, the Y in yes. And Almost like it radiates mm -hmm. out from the Y. Yes, like there's this glow of the first letter. And then I thought as well about our favorite animals. You and I both have animals that we feel like are kindred spirits. For me, when I learn more about rabbits, I always feel like I learn more about myself. And I put those rabbits on and I loved that they were in company with each other, like the two of us working and thinking. But then I wanted to add Zach as well. So I found a beautiful image of a deer laying down in repose at rest and did an outline of that with a combination of stem stitch, running stitch, back stitch. And there's this nice, the deer's hip to me looks a little bit like a cursive letter Z, which I find, I find very satisfying. Totally. I, I'm in love with that detail now. I hadn't noticed that. Uh -huh. And I um, I wanted to make it feel like a little party for this relaxing deer. So I added some lace that, of course, I got at the rummage that just looks like a little bit of bunting. It's these little triangle shapes that that go across and swoop. And and that to me felt so festive. And I think that you saw that and you you took it and ran with it. But one other thing that I added that was a fun surprise was finding some more of that negative space. So between the first two rows of moons and the third row of moons, there was this big empty abyss. And I wanted to add something there. And I also wanted to add more white to the quilt. It, like It was getting a little bit on the Halloween side for me. And I thought it needs a little white to bring things forward. So I added some transparent white fabric. I think it had some linen in it because it was very easy to get a nice sharp crisp crease in it. And then I wrapped this lace trim around the edge and it's like kind of a funny looking little oval. So you can tell it's not an actual vintage doily, even though it has that flavor. And um, and it that looks like a little squatty sausage with lace wrapped around it. <laughs> <laughs> like a little cloud. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, so those are the things that I added and I shipped it off to you. And it was so incredible for me to see the quilt when you sent it. And even now, as we're sitting down to record this episode, you highlighted a lot of things that I hadn't even seen yet. Heidi, can we do that in just a second? Oh, yeah. Pin that thought. I just want to have a quick yeah. sidebar yeah. about what it is about these two animals that we see something of ourselves in. Oh, yes. For me, dear... Growing up in the South, in the country, often just appear in those liminal spaces, you know, in the dawn and the dusk around the edges of the forest. And they're watchful and they're graceful and they're calm, but they can turn on a dime and just bound out of there if they need to, as if, you know, no big deal. It's all right. <laughs> if I don't like what's happening here, I'll just go somewhere else. So there's something about deer for me that just really resonate. What is it about rabbits for you that you connect with? Mm. There are so many things that I love about rabbits. They were my childhood favorite animal as well. And I, in particular, now I love how domestic the rabbit is without being a domesticated rabbit. So it holds the space between, uh, you know, I, I write about domesticity a lot in my artist statements and being an advocate for the domestic and loving that aspect. And I have a home studio and that's very intentional that the, the blurriness between my personal life and my creative life shows up in my art. And rabbits, I, I get the joy of seeing my animal all the time. They're always in the backyard hopping around and, and that I find very satisfying. I also find that the symbolism and reality of the rabbit as a fertile animal 
is is very exciting to me. So you think about rabbits just breeding in this prolific way that you can just magically end up two rabbits become a hundred rabbits real fast. And I find that, you know, for me, my love language is touch and I just like to be around other people and something about that resonates with the rabbit. And then I as well feel like I'm a prolific maker and I want to make in a prolific way. So while I don't have any children per se, I feel like I am giving birth all the time to ideas and to things that I get to make and remembering that that's part of who I am at this core level is very satisfying to me with feeling like I'm always learning more and enjoying more about about the rabbit. Some other things that I've learned over time are that rabbits are animals of prey. And that that's something that I have in common with you as a deer person. And growing up as the child of an alcoholic, there are a lot of things that resonate with that type of an animal that has to be alert and paying attention to detail, very detail oriented. You can catch my attention with not very little. And that has been a a real moment of learning. And then as an adult unpacking and starting to chip away at some of those habits of hypervigilance and being on edge and remembering, I can settle down a little bit. I don't need to be that cautious all the time has, has been an incredible moment of learning for me from rabbits. Your mouth, the God's ear. That's Mm -hmm. yeah, that's beautiful. One of the things that I think people may be surprised to hear is that we, so we have three animals represented here, right? The rabbits, the deer, and the giraffe. And we may have referenced images when we were thinking about them, or maybe we were just thinking about them in our own minds. But regardless, we did not draw them out beforehand, right? We were just. We did. What are you talking about? (laughs) talking about so so I had these darling little stickers that I had just recently purchased from Snuggly Monkey which is a sewing brand that I like which is from North Carolina where you're from so that's um, right <laughs> these stickers are from Japan but that's part of what I love about Snuggly Monkey is they have a lot of things from Japan I photographed these stickers and then I printed them out real big and I actually sewed around the edge of the paper so So I printed the stickers, I cut them out with paper, used one straight pin to hold the paper in place, and I sewed around the perimeter, and then I added their little tiny faces and things inside after. So so that was my source image for my bunnies. And then the deer, I found an image online that I liked. And then I think I used some, some black. So I don't think that I drew anything there, but I think I looked very much, very frequently at the image. And that's part of why it has this really beautiful wonkiness to it of precision and imprecision. So, so those were, those were my source images. (laughs) And I love having source images, but I guess I was just under the impression that you always just kind of looked at it maybe on the screen and we're mm. stitching it in your hands. But, you know, we got we got all kinds of tricks and tools up our sleeves, don't we? Yeah. What, what was it like for you, Heidi, starting with an all-Black background for a quilt? Gosh, it's easy to forget that this quilt began as an all-Black background. That is very easy to forget, my friend. <laughs> mm-hmm. So... I think our first big move was that I had this peachy fabric that I cut a big shape out of as a base to put the moons on top of. It's on the left middle. If, if, if we got a tic-tac-toe happening, it's the left and the center box in the tic-tac-toe. And, and that was a helpful way to clear out some of that dark color. I have been challenging myself to make quilts with black backgrounds lately because of my sweetheart, Bo. Black is his favorite color. So for our two-year anniversary, I made a quilt with a black background as a gift for him. I love that quilt. Yeah. It has two little attack ponies on it. (laughs) I love that quilt. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. And I made that quilt when I was at Madeline Island, actually. 
it was, I didn't want, you know, I wanted to give him a quilt as a gift, but I didn't want it to be one of those gifts that's too heavy, like like too much. Mm -hmm. So I had to demo things for my students in Madeline Island. And I thought might as well demo some things on a quilt that will be for Bo. But I confined the making of that quilt top to the one week where I was working there. And then when I was done, it had to be done. And that was a nice way to then move on to the quilting phase of the quilt when I got home. Uh, and then about a year after that, so last September, I made another quilt with a back, black background, Magical Thinking Attempt number eight. And it was a quilt where I was thinking about Bo and my home life and my just the trajectory of where I wanted things to go in life. I was casting a spell for, for the good of my future. And, and it felt important to include Bo in that, which meant a black background. And yeah, and so I had those two quilts and I think I had just somewhat recently finished or displayed or I was real excited about that, that second quilt. And it was a lot of fun for us to work with that darker background. Yeah, because I, well, often, I know this about myself, I steer clear of black and white, unless I'm making mm. a black and white quilt. To me, black and white as colors are just too harsh, right? I tend to gravitate mm -hmm. more towards the center of those values. Is that the word art teacher? Yeah, I would Something say like that. value. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. So so <laughs> it, it was a stretch for me to start with black, but looking at it, I'm so thoroughly pleased that something I couldn't, I could not have conceived how this quote was going to turn out, but I'm so happy with. The fact that we started with a stark, strong black background mm -hmm. and it still just it just adds to the punch. It adds to that high contrast that we have with all the different elements. There's such a beautiful thing, too, with the way that you cut the negative space into the letters. The center of the O and the R are both and the A and the P are all circles. And those visually bounce with the circles that I was using in my moons the way that the navy blue moons are on top of that peach, they kind of pierce through in a way and reference the base fabric again, even though they're not part of the base fabric. And yeah, that there's just this bouncing that as well as I think like the negative space then between the blue bias tape around the yes, it's just like these little hits of black and you can't quite differentiate on the finished quilt which is the base showing through and which is applique on top. Yeah, it just keeps playing with your eye, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And there's a spirit of play. And I think that's an important energy of the quilt also that we feel so excited. Yeah, like, yes, more to play mm -hmm. in these careers that are bridging, balancing, right? Because it's so easy to have take, take the thing you love, make it your job, and then you can be miserable. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I've heard that story before. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so how do you keep it feeling playful and beloved? And there's a lot of play energy in here. And I think representative, too, of our friendship and, and playing and, and just wanting to, you know, me wanting to finish my half and send you a beautiful, energetic surprise. And then you finishing up the quilt and wanting to send a playful, exciting surprise back. Now, one thing that we haven't talked about is a special little surprise that I had for you, mm -hmm. which was one of the things that you and I were bemoaning that whole week in Milwaukee was the traffic and how like highway exits, like going out to your aunt's house, for example, would be open in one direction, but closed in the next, yep. you know, as you just never knew how to get anywhere. Milwaukee is awash with construction at the moment. Our infrastructure is getting an upgrade. <laughs> it's going to be amazing in like five years, but for now mm -hmm. it's a bit of a headache, right? <laughs> yes. And one of the days when I was walking to Collectivo to get some coffee to do my little morning work session, I saw this little rectangular piece of uh, reflector, plastic reflector that must have come off some piece of construction equipment or something. It's about two inches tall and about a half inch wide. And I said, this is going to be so funny when I sew it down because you and I had had so many moments where we're like, Ugh, traffic. And so here's a piece of construction equipment sewn down on top of this quilt. I just made a couple little pockets on either side out of fabric and just kind of stuck that thing in there. And I think wow. it's, it's really kind of precious. It's like a little jewel encrusted in the middle of all of your, your calendar moons. I love that you added that. I didn't even see it until you pointed it out 
to me because there were so many other things that drew my eye immediately with the big swoops of white lace going around. And then you added that extra blue with the polka dots. And and, and it was such a, a wonderful surprise today to get to notice that we had signed the quilt. We got our HZ23 and this bit of construction and even this red flower moon that you added is... Tell me about that one. Well, it references the three moons that you put in just to the right of that. Those were there first. And so those are three navy moons that have heavy light-colored stitching on top, quilting them down. Mm -hmm. And in the center, it has like a little, almost like a little drop of golden jelly, right, in each one of those (gasps) navy moons. And so I had this beautiful orange dinner napkin that had an embroidered gold flower. And it just reminded me, they spoke to those moons that you had already sewn down. So I cut out a little circle, the same size mm-hmm. as your moons, and just plopped that orange dinner napkin with the gold flower center right beside the three moons you had made and made a fourth moon. I might have played oh. with our historical calendar a little bit. but you know. I like that. Like, yeah. you know, a little nod to all the days that came before the buying there you of go. the plane ticket. There and, you go. Mm-hmm. Also, you have in the bottom right corner a Liberty Bell and that was a, a wonderful detail that we talked about and we're anticipating pretty early on. Yeah, you might be better at telling this story. Okay, I think we were just trying to think of extra imagery to add. We were at that starting point. We we're trying to figure out we got these giraffes and what what else what else goes with them? And you have this beautiful phrase about a self-led life and I believe that's connected as well to our friend Luke and picturing a self-led life. You know, there's there's also this history of the school bell where I was a high school art teacher for a long time. You were a high school Spanish teacher. And, you know, you got to live your life by the bell when you're a teacher. You got to be on and teaching for 50 minutes, and then you can go to the bathroom for five minutes. And then you got to be on and teaching for five minutes. And then even though it's 10, 20 in the morning, that's your lunch. So you got to eat lunch. <laughs> Even and if you're not hungry. No, nope, no. Nope. And so that living by the bell contrasted with feeling free, like you get to make your own schedule and proclaiming that freeness, I think, is very exciting. Yeah. Yeah. And I think I was, I think it's interesting to hear you make the connection with the school bell because I was thinking more about the liberty aspect of like mm-hmm. how a bell creates something from the center core that radiates out. Right. And Mm. that's unstoppable. Who knows where that's going to go? And and I think for me, this brings us to another point that was just an incredibly charming, delightful text that I got from you. (laughs) And, and, And we were reflecting on how we made this quilt called Yes More Please. And you said, but Heidi, wasn't 2023 supposed to be our shared year of no? We've been saying no to things left and right, and it's been beautiful. It's been awesome. And we were so inspired by Lisa Congdon and this idea of saying no more often. And and, and we we were real serious about this year of no. And then we make this quilt called Yes More Please. And how do these seemingly conflicting concepts actually, they to me, they make sense. It's a year of no of saying no to excess collaborations, of getting spread too thin, of being pulled in a variety of directions, of conforming ourselves to fit other structures, which means then a great big giant yes to self-hosted teaching and other other pursuits. Like right now, I've just recently launched my year-long course on quilt making It's so exciting. It's incorporating a mighty network, which I feel connected to in part because of you and the Nook being on a mighty network and getting to do something so big through just me and not some other entity hosting it is just a prime example of what I was trying to say yes more please to. And I also think about the orange in this quilt and how you said you have an aversion to orange. And for me, the Nook is orange, right? I'm I'm known for having a lot of tabs open all the time on my browser. And my little orange tab that's always open to the nook is for you. 
And, and so I think there's something real interesting about, about you choosing that self-led life and yes, more to your self-hosted pursuits on the Nook and to having the Nook huddle, which is just, oh, I'm thrilled for you that you're going to be able to meet in person with other people on the Nook and being able to give birth to those two projects is something that we could only do because it was our year of no. Exactly. We said no to make space for the yes, mm -hmm. right? And I think, you know, it's funny. I don't know why I picked orange for the nook, but in retrospect, it is kind of a school bus orange. Mm -hmm. And it makes me think, I kind of like it because it makes me think that it's like, it's this collective vessel that's, we're all on, we're all on this ride together. We're going somewhere. I guess we're going to school, a place where we're going to learn tools and, and mm -hmm. tricks and tips for better living, you know? So in that sense, orange makes a lot of sense. Well, I think there's only one last thing to say. Do you have any other thoughts? So yeah, the quilt, the back of the quilt is another fabric that I got at the rummage. It's a floral. It's got these orange flowers with a blue sky background and a lot of green leaves. And it's a technique for creating a self-binding quilt that I learned from you, Zach Foster. And now it is my number one favorite go-to for binding a quilt. I love that I don't have to get my rotary cutter out and have my fingers close to the end. Anytime I don't have to iron, that actually became abundantly clear, Zach. When we were collaborating, you are a lover of an iron. You like to always will, have it on. You like to press things. I will things. iron that quilt. I will iron that quilt because I love seeing how after you quilt it down, all the layers just kind of oof, together. It's like it's like a spa treatment. It's like, let me take my quilt to the sauna is what it is. <laughs> there are these things that you that I would never iron in the entire process of making a quilt. It would never be ironed. Uh, and so that was fascinating to learn. And that's part of the real joy, I think, that you and I found in collaborating was getting to learn things because I tend to shy away from raw edges. And there's some things that I learned about working with raw edges that I enjoyed very much in this quilt. I also don't often connect the batting early on. And there were some fun things that I got to unpack and discover with doing that. And this technique for the self-binding quilt, being able to wrap that backing around, it makes it feel like one thing in a really powerful way. I love that the backing isn't two parts that like unpacks and reveals for the viewer that it was made by two you know separate people in separate places uh, so that is a really cool technique i love i love that that happened and the left side of the quilt i bound before i sent it to you and i would be so curious to get to see it in person some of the subtle differences between how you did that self binding on the right side the person who taught me uh, just to get to see that shift would be exciting as well. Yeah, as you pointed out, one of the funny things is I was sewing from day one straight into the batting, right? Like I was quilting it into the batting without a backing. And so you sent me the left-hand side of the quilt already quilted with the backing on it and the backing flapping in the breeze on the right-hand <laughs> side that I could attach to my half. And so truth be told, while the, you and I have a very pretty picture of this quilt now, my half isn't entirely, the back of it is not 100% secure yet. I got some more <laughs> sewing to do on the back. But mm. the binding's nice. You know, self-binding is easy, it's quick. I love that it allows, it gives space on the front for the back. Like it creates that kind of, mm, take a peek. You know, it's like a seems like a little invitation yes. of what's coming next. It's not as strong, you know, so if folks listen to this, are like, oh, how should I bind my quilt? You know, if you're really interested in durability, when you look at an old quilt that's self-bound, they're almost always mm, worn along that edge, right? So it's not not as durable, but it sure is easy and quick, and it feels very integrated with the whole. Well, and to me, it's a nice way of me saying, maybe don't tumble dry this. Maybe don't even wash it. Like a lot of my quilts, the intention is that they'd be on the wall, on display, like a painting. And by not making a choice to do something on the bias, which is more durable, the same way that your cuffs on your clothes are very fragile and you can just snip and rip your fabric, that can happen to the binding when it's this way. But, uh, you know, the more wobbly your quilt, we have a beautiful wobble on the bottom oh, in particular. Yes. 
that creates a slight bias, which does then make the binding slightly stronger than it would be if it were perfectly square. (laughs) You know, that sounds really optimistic, Heidi. I like that about you. (laughs) I think there's only one last Mm -hmm. thing for us to do, and that is I have signed the quilt. In the bottom right-hand corner, I wrote Zach Attack, just because, I don't know, I wanted to mix it up. You still got to sign it. So at some point, we got to get together, and we need Mm. to get your Heidi Parks on this quilt. We can make that happen. Probably probably June. (laughs) (laughs) Probably June, next time I come to town. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Well, Heidi, thank you so much for walking down memory lane with me in this quilt and Just sharing the stories about what went into making this very special quilt that you and I both had a hand in. I hope we get to make another one next year. I'm just going to go and put that out there. I wouldn't mind it. I wouldn't mind it either. I feel like I learned a lot. I got to have so much fun with you in a new way. We already have fun in so many ways. And it was great to get to do another collaboration. And just the, the back and forth of this was so much fun. It felt really deeply collaborative and like a learning opportunity. And I would, you know, I, when I teach, I try to, I try to pair people up and create buddies and friendships. And, and so if you are listening to this, think about who you could make a collaborative quilt with. There's probably someone they could be on the Nook. They could be on Instagram. You like their work. You'd like to learn with them. You don't need to be together in person. You can do things just in the meal. And it was a great thing to do. I would highly recommend it to other people. Yeah. And I think one of the things that makes our this particular collaboration between you and me is that without a doubt, our styles and our aesthetic have overlaps quite a bit. Over the years, you've influenced me. I've influenced you. Yes. But that doesn't mean that we've evolved in the same direction this entire time, right? Like there, mm-hmm. there are still some areas where our processes and approach and aesthetics are different. And so it's really fun for me as just as a as, as a maker, as a creative person to happen upon those areas where you and I are differentiated. And I'm like, oh, that is another way to do this thing. Yeah. So I think, you know, in, in terms of like thinking about who I would want to collaborate with, it is thinking about that proportion of how much do we have in common, but also how different are we? Like, how can I stretch a little bit? Because we're not mm-hmm. working together to just make the same old thing that we could make if we were working apart, right? Amen. Yeah. (laughs) All right, Heidi. Well, here's to the next one. Cheers to the next one. Thank you, my friend. I hope you enjoyed that conversation as much as I did. Now, before we meet again, make sure you put your name in the hat for that Seamside Nook giveaway Two annual memberships are going to go to two lucky people. Might as well be you. Until then, take care, sew something good, and hope to see you around the nook.